Welcome to the How to Fish podcast with Tailored Tackle. I'm Ed Hitchcock, your host, and today we are doing an advanced episode. And advanced means somewhere between beginner and expert. Basically, you know how to fish and you want to get better at fishing. Today's episode is going to be on freshwater fishing lures. And I know it might be challenging to learn about them via audio. If you already know what these lures look like, that's great. That's how I like to learn is through audio and I can envision what the lures look like. If you don't know what the lures look like, you should go to our website, taylortackle.com, go to the resource section and get into our fishing resources library. Here you can download our how to fish book. I talked about this a little bit on the last episode. And with this book, you'll be able to look at all these lures and a lot of the things I'm talking about are covered here in a visual presentation. For now, let's cover it on audio. It's the best way that I can learn. And so I hope it's the best way you can learn. So freshwater lures are broadly broken down into two sections. When we're talking about them, they're going to be either soft-bodied lures or they're going to be hard-bodied lures. Soft-bodied lures are lures made of soft plastic material. These are typically worms and grubs. Uh, they can even get a little bit more fancy and be, you know, shaped in creatures or swim baits. Uh, there's there's millions of them out there. But what they all have in common is, is they're a soft, flexible plastic that can be rigged up in a multitude of ways. So it's less about what the actual plastic is than how you are rigging it up and presenting it. When we talk about hard-bodied lures, these are going to be fixed metal or fixed plastic lures that do what they do based on how they were built originally. So there's not a lot of flexibility like there is with soft lures where, you know, if you had a soft plastic worm, you could rig it up in 20 different ways and present it a bunch of different ways. A hard-bodied lure is going to be typically used for a specific tactic or technique. So keep that in mind when I'm talking about, you know, a soft-bodied lure versus a hard-bodied lure. It's not that one version is better than the other. It's just they serve different purposes, and it's just a good schematic breakdown of what we're talking about here. So when you're thinking about things, I might be talking kind of generally soft-body and generally hard-body at different times. Soft body lures are a really great place to start as a beginner because they give you a lot of flexibility and they're generally pretty versatile. Let's stick with the most common ones and that those are going to be worms and grubs. So if you were to put me on an island and say, OK, Ed, you can pick one fishing lure. You can have as many as you want, but you can only have one. And that's the only lure you're using for the rest of your life. And you got to survive. I would pick the curl tail grub. It sounds crazy, but it's this little three inch curly tail grub. It was one of the very first soft plastics that ever came out. I think that it has stood the test of time and is, you know, an absolute central source to everybody's tackle box. And that's because this smaller profile grub, which is, you know, about three inches with a curly tail on the back can can be presented in a multitude of ways. It's super versatile. So it can be presented as a bait fish. It can be presented as an insect. It can be presented as really any sort of like bait that you want to mimic, depending on how you rig it up and how you work it. Uh, it's also that kind of profile where it's three inches. You can get small ones. They can be an inch long. You can get giant ones. They can be six inches long. But when you get that kind of middle of the ground, two and a half to three inch curl tail grub, almost every species can take that. Maybe some of the smaller panfish species can't take it, but you know, your bass, your perch, your walleye, your pike, um, all of the common freshwater species will hit a curl tail grub. Now then you might look at me and you say, Ed, well, if you're on an island, it's probably salt water. That's what's crazy about the curl tail grub. I know we're focused on freshwater in this episode, but like I use the curl tail grub in saltwater all the time. It's like a go to. It works great for um, speckled trout and drum and snook, which are kind of the most common in the Gulf area. And they work well for everything. Bluefish. I mean, just it, it, it's it's a concept, right? What is the bait trying to represent? The bait is trying to represent bait. So if you can find something that can work for your body of water that represents the natural forage, you found your 
hard bait or your soft bait, right? And so the curl tail grub is super flexible. Now, if the curl tail grub is such an easy, awesome thing that Ed would use on an island if he was stranded there, then why is he using anything else? Well, the curl tail grub is the most versatile lure of all time. It isn't the greatest lure of all time for everything. And so in different situations, right, I will catch way more fish or way bigger fish on something other than a curl tail grub. But the curl tail grub is my backup plan for a ton of different situations because it can work for almost everything, right? It's just not going to be the best for everything all of the time. So let's start talking about the other soft plastics. It really goes down to size and profile. So the larger the soft plastic, the larger fish you're targeting. The smaller the soft plastic, the smaller fish. Now, that doesn't mean that a big fish won't hit a small profile, but what you'll see happens is if you're targeting a specific species or want to target a larger species, you're going to have to sort through a lot of smaller fish. So if I'm trying to target bass, right, and I'm in a pond, there's a bunch of big bass in there, but there's also a ton of panfish in there and everything wants to hit a three inch curl tail grub. It's not going to be very efficient for me to continuously use that curl tail grub because I'm going to spend half my time catching the smaller fish that I'm not going after. So then I would step up my pro profile and size and shape. So something like a finesse worm, which is typically around six inches um, that I can fish faster and it's bigger, it's going to be a lot harder for these small fish to use the burst of energy to go as fast as I'm fishing that bigger profile. And they also just can't like, they can't swallow it, right? Like it's the size of them. They might hit the hook and you might catch some every once in a while, but it's going to be hard for them to take down a six inch soft plastic if they're not a larger bass. So that's the kind of concept with size when we're talking about soft plastics, but then there's also the shape, right? And so a more slender shape is going to fish quicker. So if you were to rig it up straight and it's, it's, um, it's linear with your line, it is going to move through the water faster. So if the fish were more aggressive, that's great. Um, or if you're jigging the lure, that's great because you're kind of keeping it in place. But if the fish are lethargic, um, this great example of the worm, you would switch over to like a wacky rig, right? Where you're using what a lot of people call a Senko. You're not actually supposed to call them a Senko if you don't sell Senkos. Uh, but they're, they're a wacky worm. We call them wacky worms. Everybody makes them. Everybody sells them. But uh, I'm talking about those stick baits and a stick bait can be rigged in a different way where it just kind of floats down and it's and it's perpendicular to your line. It's not parallel with it. So it's it's really about size and the way you're rigging it up and the shape of the soft plastic that's going to dictate how it's presented in the water. And you're choosing how to present it in the water based on the species or the goals that you're having that day. Right. Am I going for largemouth bass. Okay, great. Do I want to fish for smaller largemouth bass and a couple different species, or do I want to target the biggest bass in the pond? And so that's your thought process that you're going through with soft plastics. And so these, these just kind of like the most common, if you're, if you're just getting started out, you're building up your tackle box. I would focus on these three soft plastics. I would focus on a finesse worm. I would focus on a stick bait or a wacky worm. We call them wacky worms. And I would focus on a grub. Those are the three that you kind of need. Um, they cover most of the bases where you're fishing a large or small soft plastic and you're fishing them fast or slow. So that kind of rounds out your bases. You don't need to buy everything under the earth to, you know, create a presentation and use all of the kind of common soft plastic rigs. You only need a handful and then you can buy more body styles and soft plastics to work on the rigs that you're comfortable with and even try new rigs so that you can kind of open up your arsenal and try different techniques and tactics that will work for different conditions and different days. So going back to these three soft plastics that we're talking about and rigging them up, we'll kind of start with the finesse worm. I'll go back to the, 
the beginning here and the finesse worm is really great for texas rigging because texas rigging is fast um you're you're kind of you're trying to bounce it along the bottom and if you don't know what a texas rig is it's typically a extra wide gap worm hook it's one of those bigger bass hooks and the soft plastic is threaded through it in a way where in the middle section the worm is covering the top of the hook point so that it doesn't catch in all of the weeds and then the worm is worked up there's diagrams in the book or just google a texas rig if you're using a texas rig it's going to have a bullet weight on top of it um also called just like a worm weight and what you're trying to do with that texas rig is you're trying to bounce it along the bottom or drag it along the bottom in kind of thicker cover cover meaning weeds and logs and branches and stuff and so you're trying to rip that through now the finesse worm has a really slim profile so it also can kind of rip through and not get caught and so when you're using that texas rig and you're ripping it through and you're jigging it and you're bouncing it along the bottom what's happening is it's not only cutting through the bottom but it's stopping on the bottom and when it stops on the bottom that tail of the finesse worm will float up and it'll look like an aquatic insect or a worm coming up off the bottom so here's another thing that i'm going to kind of talk about with soft plastics is the pause so when you're working a soft plastic through the water you know sometimes if you're just swimming it through the fish will bite but a lot of the times the fish will bite on that pause so the texas rig is really good because during the pause it actually mimics an insect or a worm an aquatic insect uh, after it's run along the bottom stopping and kind of digging into the ground uh, because that weight hits the bottom and then the bo and then the back of the tail flips up so that's the texas rig that's what i'm using it for now i'm fishing that fast right so i'm i'm bringing it in i'm doing kind of big swoops with it where i'm jigging it up letting it fall back down and pausing uh when i have a little an area with a little bit less cover i'm kind of dragging it along the bottom um and then i can kind of speed it up and reel it in a little bit faster if i want but that thin profile of a finesse worm will be able to punch in and out of the cover and move quickly um and vibrate its tail up and wiggle it when it hits the bottom and so that's what i like to use when i'm using a texas rig now let's say the reverse right let's say the bass aren't super aggressive I'm going to use a wacky rig. That's my like second go-to. So like if I want to fish for bass, I'm thinking fast and slow. So if there are, if there's an aggressive bite, I want to use the Texas rig. If it is a slower bite, it's less aggressive. I want to use the wacky rig. Now there's a bunch of different rigs that can go in between those and way on the outside of those. But if you think about it in terms of just fast and slow, these two will work for both of those bites. It's typically going to be a fast bite or it's going to be a slow bite. So now if it's a slow bite, I like the wacky rig and that I use with a stick bait like we were talking about earlier. Um, and so I use a little octopus hook, uh, like a size one or size two. And I pinch that either right through the plastic on the top of it, right in the middle of the worm, or I use a wacky O-ring, which will just let the life of the worm stay alive longer uh, because you're not tearing through the plastic um, and so you kind of wiggle that o-ring up into the middle of the stick bait and then you put your hook through the o-ring rather than through the plastic i kind of pinch the plastic on the hook just like a little bit but not a huge amount and that kind of guarantees like a consistent presentation um, and it also uh, it, it will improve the lifespan of your soft plastic bait so I'm pinching it through the middle. So if you can imagine that, if you take like a plastic worm, a stick bait, and you hook it right through the middle of it, I mean, it looks crazy out of water. Um, but what you'll see when you drop it into the water is that both of the sides wiggle on their way down. So it's weird. It's like this parabolic effect where once it hits the water and it sinks, the weight of the middle pushes down and then the water pushes back up and it wiggles on both sides and so it kind of wiggles down vertically and then when you pull it through it bends um so the the process with that rig 
is I'm casting it out. I'm letting it wiggle down to the bottom with its two sides wiggling up and down. Um, and then I'm stopping. Uh, and, and I'm probably counting to like two to three seconds for that to get down. And then I'm jigging it back up, just like kind of like ripping it up, not too fast, but just like a pull. And then I, I'm reeling in the slack and then I'm letting it fall down again. And you want to keep letting it fall down. You don't just want to like work it back. You want to let it go all the way up and then wiggle all the way down the water column. Even sometimes just hit the bottom, then rip it back up again. Let it wiggle back down. Um, and what's pretty cool is that the pausing effect that I've been talking about is going to become so apparent when you're doing the wacky rig because the majority of your bites are going to happen when that wacky rig is in that pause motion like when it's floating down and it hits the bottom and you start reeling up to remove the slack and all of a sudden you just have a fish on it's not going to be like a fast bite that came out when you are reeling in it's like oh there was a fish on the other side of your line for like a second you didn't know and now you're setting the hook on it um and so that that pause is going to come is going to become very apparent to you uh, because you're giving the fish an opportunity to take a bite, right? It's not to say that when they're aggressive, they're not going to hit a moving bait because they will. We're going to cover that with the hard-bodied lures in a sec, which are typically a more aggressive style bait um, that are typically always moving. The pause is going to allow the lethargic fish to catch up to your bait and make a commitment. And a lot of times when they're slower, they need you to <laughs> lower the learning curve a little bit and let them come up and take a bite, investigate it a little bit, smell it. They need that second to commit to it rather than, oh, something flew through my face. I got a reaction hit, which is typically, you know, a harder, harder bodied lure. So the wacky worm and the uh, finesse worm. Those are for bass, generally speaking. The wacky worm or stick bait should be around five inches. You can get a four inch one, but it should be around five inches. Texas rigs around six inches. So when you get to that level, you're looking at soft plastics for bass. And the, the reason why you see so many soft plastics out there for bass is because bass reaction hit to a lot of stuff. They, they like flashy, loud lures. And then if they are lethargic, they'll still hit flashier soft baits rather than live bait um, because they're just genuinely more aggressive than most fish species. So you're using a lot of artificial lures for bass. And that's why like a lot of these conversations that we're having today are going to be focused on bass because artificial lures are really the peak presentation for bass fishing. Now, for species outside of bass, when it comes to soft plastics, my catch-all is the curl tail grub and I, and honestly like i would recommend if you're using soft plastics to focus on curl tail grubs for everything else in fresh water there are species specific ones you'll see them in our kits uh that we make really kind of species specific ones where you kind of get up into that expert level but for now as like an intermediate angler you should be focusing on curl tail grubs for everything else outside of bass and fresh water. So that's going to be trout and pike and walleye and perch and crappie and then even some larger bluegills and other, you know, panfish, sunfish will hit a curl tail grub. The number one way to rig a curl tail grub is on a jig head, uh, a quarter ounce jig head or an eighth in, or yeah eighth inch a quarter ounce jig head or an eighth ounce jig head is kind of the traditional uh, quarter ounce if you're dealing with windy heavy water heavy currents um or uh an eighth if the conditions are a little bit easier and what you're gonna do with that curl tail grub and a jig is a you can jig it so you're bouncing it off the bottom and you're reeling it back in you can swim it uh where you're gradually retrieving it and the tail is fluttering in the water um, and that's going to create ripples and you swim it back um, and then you can also do something that's pretty interesting it's throwing the curl tail grub under a slip float so that you can work it between swimming pausing or jigging and pausing and keep it up above the weeds and so that's a really great way to target 
fish in very weedy areas is to throw it underneath a bobber so that it stays in position. Now, the number one rule is to almost never present any of your soft plastics under a bobber. I see this all the time with beginners where they take a plastic worm, they put it on a hook, they put it on a bobber, they cast it out there and wait for a fish to hit it. With lures in general, you need to be creating some kind of movement to recreate a bait so that it will entice a fish to strike. When you're casting out live bait underneath a float or moving it in or whatever you're doing, you can leave it still because that live bait is moving and that live bait smells like it's alive because it is. Um, and so between scent and movement, the live bait has you covered. It's doing it for you. But if you just go and you put a plastic worm on, you throw it on a bobber, you let it sit there, nothing's going to happen. Like unless these fish are absolutely starved, they're not hitting that lure underneath a bobber. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you're an absolute beginner as an advanced angler, you, you probably have figured that out already. But this is the only caveat is using a curl tail grub underneath a slip float and you're not using the slip float to necessarily, you know, cast it out there and leave it. You're using it because it'll keep a jig and a grub above a certain amount of cover so that you can work it back in and give it a pause. So it works really well for crappie. So those are kind of like the three ways to present a curl tail grub when it's on a jig. And that's the most versatile way to use it. Now there's other things you can do with a curl tail grub, like a drop shot rig, which I also like. And this is my last rig for you guys as an advanced group. We can get into way more rigs than we will on the expert level size, but the drop shot's kind of the last one. And this is where you're tying the hook up about a foot or two up on your line and leaving a foot or two of tag end on your line where you're going to tie a weight on. So basically the rig is gonna look like there's a weight, there's a foot of line, and that foot above the weight is where your hook's gonna be. And so that allows you to drag your soft plastic or even your live bait along the bottom, but presenting your bait about a foot above the bottom. And that's important because most of these bait fish um, or, you know, what whatever it is, they're typically not just moving along the bottom perfectly. They're typically, you know, maybe a foot or so off the bottom. And a lot of these fish are feeding a foot or so off the bottom. A lot of these fish like to feed upwards. They don't like to feed downwards. So it's good to have that separation. And it also keeps your hook from catching on the stuff on the bottom. So you're presenting your bait as close as you can to the bottom and slowly dragging it through. But you're not getting your hook caught. You're only getting your uh, drop shot weight down there and that's going to kind of bounce around and it's not going to get caught on rocks and weeds as much as your hook would. So that's the drop shot rig. Those are my rigging and soft bait styles. The last thing I want to touch on with soft bait is color. I don't want to get too in the weeds here, but the theory behind it that I want you to think about is what am I presenting? And then I'm going to convert that into a color. So I don't want you to go and look at your tackle box and say, oh, that's the prettiest chartreuse or that one's got a lot of glitter on it. That looks good. I'm going to use that one. And I'm a victim of that. I, I do it still. And I and I shouldn't. And I, I've learned my lesson enough to tell you guys and share with you my lesson. But I think you'll really step your game up if you think about what technique you're using to create a presentation and then classifying your color according to that. So if you want to fish fast, what bait will typically be moving fast? That will be a minnow. Or if you, you know, are catching fish and you're cleaning them and you see that they're eating minnows or you just know that they're eating minnows, you're like, okay, I'm going for minnows. You should be using white because you're mimicking a minnow. You want that light color. If you are mimicking an insect or a worm, you want browns and greens. If you're mimicking a leech, um, you want to use black. So there are a bunch of colors on this spectrum and there's a bunch of flashy ways to do it. But I would look at it as, OK, what what do I think that they're eating? Do I think they're eating minnows? Then I'm going to use white. Do I think that they're eating worms? I'm going to use brown or green. Do I think they're using leeches? I'm going to use black. Um, 
and that's how I want you to think about it. So how fast do those things move? If I'm using something quick, um, like I'm jigging or swimming a curl tail grub, I think that you should be using white. If you're just jigging and bouncing and dragging that curl tail grub on the bottom, which is how leeches move, I would use black. If you're using these longer worms for bass, I generally recommend using natural colors, meaning those browns and those greens. It's great to have some flakes in there that'll give it a little bit more pop, but there's only really specialized circumstances to go way outside of the norm to either go really bright or really dark on the color spectrum. And, and we'll talk about that in expert level episodes. So that is my general lesson on soft baits. Let's work into hard baits now. So hard baits are going to be a fixed presentation. Typically, you're going to have a lot less wiggle room to rig them up in a variety of ways and present them in a variety of ways because the way in which they're designed is typically for movement. And so that movement is going to dictate how fast the lure needs to be presented. And that's about it, right? Like when you're using these rigs, you can move them fast or slow. You can drop them up and down the water column. But when you're using things like crankbaits, spoons, spinners. These are kind of what we're going to cover. These are the three big ones that we're going to cover today. The way in which they're built needs to be consistently presented. And so let's talk about a crankbait. This is a good example. This is a hard bodied plastic lure. It is going to mimic a minnow typically, right? We're just going to cover minnow crankbaits. Um, it is a hard body plastic, so it's hard. Um, and it's going to have a lip on the front of it. And that lip is going to either be longer or shorter, depending on how deep the crankbait will swim. And so just a medium sized crankbait, like we have in our freshwater kit, uh, that's in a silver color. It has a medium depth. Um, it's going to go anywhere between, you know, four to nine feet, right? And that lip is going to dive it down. And the way that this, uh, not the swivel, but the, the split ring on the front of it um, and the body of the lure and the depth, it's going to decide how that crankbait wiggles. And so as you are reeling it in, you are providing, or not you are, the bait itself is providing the action. It's providing the presentation. So that's important because if you cast it out and you don't do anything with it, it's just going to sit there. But if you reel it in, it's going to create its movement. Um, and so as you are reeling in, it is mimicking a minnow and that minnow can go fast. It can go slow, but it has to go somewhere to create the movement to mimic the minnow. Otherwise, it's just going to sit there and, and with a floating crankbait, most of these are going to be floating. Some of them are suspending uh, with a floating crankbait. It's going to float and then you're going to create the movement and floating is good, especially if you're in weedy areas, because you might want to cast into a location, then drive it down and then let it float back up to get over some stuff or a suspending one is going to kind of slowly sink. Um, and as it sinks, you can move it around and then it'll kind of float back up or, you know, it, it it's buoyant. It's more buoyant. Anyways, let's not get too deep into that. We're just covering a regular minnow crankbait. Now, what crankbaits are typically used for are fast striking fish. So that is going to be bass, walleye, pike, and trout, especially these like the typical crankbait that you think of and the size, it's not specialized or anything. It's like a three inch crankbait um, and it's got a mid diving lip. That's gonna be used for kind of those bigger species, those more aggressive fish. And so because they're aggressive, they love this bait, right? It's hard. It's not going to get beat up too bad. You're not going to have to switch your soft plastics all the time. You can fish it really fast because it requires it to be fished fast and it's loud and it mimics a wounded bait fish in a way. So there's balls inside of it. Typically, the one that we make has um, BBs inside of it and those are rattling. So it's, you know, moving quick in the water. It's rattling, it's wobbling left and right. It's a really loud bait. And so when I am presenting that, there's really two presentations that can happen with a crankbait. The first one is going to be just a constant steady swim in. 
And that's really what I want you to use the majority of the time. That's going to be really great for walleye and pike and bass, you know, majorly for pike. They just love like a constant swimming action and they want to chase after that and they want to take a big hit. So you would cast it out and you would steadily retrieve it. I would say the 1-1000 to 1000 for a full rotation is probably a safe bet. As you cast and retrieve more, you're going to understand how quickly it's going. You want to feel that consistent vibration. You don't want to go so fast that the lure isn't feeling like a consistent thump against your line, and you don't want to go too slow that like you keep seeing it float back up to the top of the water. So that's just like a consistent thing. You're letting the lure do the work for you. It's going to be loud. It's going to be wobbly. And... You're just going to cast it and retrieve it. You you really want to cover as much water as you can because you're in search of the most aggressive fish and you're trying to call a fish to you. So because of that, if you just cast in a straight line over and over and over again, um, it's not going to be as productive as consistently moving spots, walking down the shoreline or, you know, floating, um, floating down a bit more on your boat or kayak or whatever. Um, you just want to be casting into a new location on each cast. I like to think of it like a clock. Um, if I got half of a clock face in front of me, each cast is going to be a different hour on the clock. Uh, so just another little tip there. Now, swimming it back is pretty much, you know, 80% of the time is what I'm doing with a crankbait. If I want to entice some bass and they're kind of in that middle ground between aggressive and lethargic, like they'll hit a crankbait, but they're not jumping in the water for it. Uh, what I like to do is, and this is where the crankbait gets its name from, is a crank and pause, meaning that I'm crank, crank, crank. So I drive it down maybe three or four feet. I'm feeling that vibration. It's just like I'm swimming it, but then I'm pausing and I'm waiting like a second. And that makes it look like the bait fish is wounded. And that's an interesting play. Um, because sometimes it turns off fish. I haven't had a lot of luck with pike and walleye with that because they kind of, they like consistency is, is an observation that I've seen and, the, and it can spook them a little bit when you just abruptly stop. They're like, wait a second, what was I doing? I don't know if this is what I want to go after. And they go away. Whereas like a bass, if it's, if it's a little lethargic, you can kind of, um, you can still use your crankbait, but what you do is you crank down it goes two to three feet down in the water. You pause, it starts to float up a little bit. And then you do it again, you do it again, you do it again. And you just repeat that. Um, so if you're if you're targeting bass, I like to switch up between just swimming it back and then cranking and pausing. Uh, but, you know, 80% of the time you should just be reeling it back in consistently. Try it, try a couple different things. Try every once in a while, just pausing in the middle, doing your crank and pausing. Another good thing too, is that if you're seeing a fish follow up, you can pause and then crank back down. That That's a good little trick because they maybe would have wanted to continuously follow it and hit it a little bit later, but you ran out of room, right? It's like six or seven feet in front of you. And you know that it's not going to strike it before it gets to the dock or the side of the water. You can pause and then do a figure eight, meaning like you paused and then you moved your rod tip in an eight uh, to keep the lure going back and forth somewhat in front of you and the, and the fish, whether it's a bass or a pike, won't work for walleye, but if it's a bass or a pike, a lot of times they'll stick around and come back and hit it because you're making it look like it's wounded and swimming around in a circle. Uh, so that's just another little trick. Let's move on to a spoon. Um, I'm going to talk about just like a classic pike spoon because there also are a million different types of spoons out there, but I think what you will be most familiar with and you know, I, I love it. I use it all the time is a pike spoon. Um, a brand named Daredevil came out with these a really long time ago. Now there's a bunch of different ways to build them. We build them a little bit different with a much bigger treble hook um, and a much bigger split shot or not split shot, uh, split ring. Um, and that's just what we want to do. And we laminate the spoon itself a lot thicker. Uh, so it doesn't get beat up as much, but everybody makes their spoons a little bit differently. Every brand makes a spoon. Um, I think ours is the most durable, uh, but you know, I'm biased. So with a pike spoon, uh, this is going to be that like red and white lure 
that looks like a really long spoon. It looks like a really long, narrow spoon that starts a little bit skinny on top and then goes wide towards the back. And these are kind of around two and a half to three inches long. You can get them bigger, you can get them smaller. Uh, but this is probably the easiest lure to learn how to use because all you're doing is you're casting it out and you're reeling it back in slow and steady. Uh, just keep it up uh, somewhere in the middle of the water column. So if you're in shallow water with thick weeds, this probably isn't the lure for you, but it really shines in that four to 10 feet depths where it can kind of be casted out and retrieved about uh, three to five feet off of the bottom. And I just love this lure for those days out in the water, especially in the middle of the day. If you have northern pike or pickerel in the body of water that you're fishing, it's just a fun lure. It'll catch fish all day, especially the bigger, more aggressive ones. And bass will hit this too. And I've had walleye hit this and I've even had trout hit it, especially on the smaller ones. Smaller spoons for trout work very well. But, you know, your classic white and red pike spoon is is just my go to for pike. I mean, that's why it's in the name. Um, and what this is doing is it's using one side as red and white is kind of giving that image of a wounded kind of bleeding fish. And then the other side is just going to be blank metal and that's going to reflect the sunlight. And so you're, you're creating this kind of motion where it's this wobbling wounded bait fish, and then it's getting flashes like a scale would flash if it's getting hit by another fish. And so spoons are just loud visually. They're not as loud like physically as a crankbait would be, but they're super loud visually. So for those visual strikers, especially pike, um, it works great. Uh, so just make sure that you're reeling it in at a consistent speed. You don't want to go too fast. You don't want to go too slow. If you go too fast, it's not going to get deep enough in the water column for those pike to hit it. Um, and if you go too slow, you're going you're gonna to pick up a lot of weeds. These things are weed magnets. So you're doing everything you can to keep it at least about a foot above the weeds. You're going to have to deal with weeds because pike and bass um, especially are going to be adjacent to different weed beds and pike spoons should be casted, should be cast um, parallel to the weed beds. We talked about this a little bit in the first episode where weeds are typically parallel to the shoreline, which means that there's a usually a transition that happens in depth where it goes from shallow to deep or or sandy to that weed um and you want to cast in parallel right on the outside of the weeds uh because a you don't want to get your lure stuck in all the weeds it's going to be super annoying um and and it's not going to work if it's covered in weeds a fish is going to hit it uh but also just like fish use those weed edges and those transitions as an ambush and staging point to feed. So not only does it help you in terms of not getting weeds on your lure, but it also just helps you in terms of putting your lure in front of fish. So we talked a lot about pike and bass and, and walleyes for crankbait side of things. Let's talk a little bit about spinners. This is going to kind of cover us up a little bit. I'm not talking about bass spinners. I'm talking about inline spinners. Um, and this is going to round out our species focus where we're going to start talking about trout a little bit. Uh, feather spinners and brass rattle spinners. These are kind of the go to's and inline spinners mean that like there is a treble hook, then there is a piece of wire. It has some sort of body in it, whether that's brass rattles or a painted kind of lead weight. And then there is a spoon, like a smaller spoon on the front of it, on the very top. Um, and, and this is going to basically create a profile where as you're reeling in, it's in line, hence the name inline spinner, um, with your line. It's, it's, it's completely succinct. And then the spin is happening around the wire. Um, You'll see it when you when you cast one out. They're super popular. Um, again, download our freshwater uh, ebook if you do not know what I'm talking about. Uh, I have a bunch of visual examples um, and diagrams and stuff. But inline spinners are great because they work really well with current. Um, a lot of times you are going after 
trout and panfish species with some current if you're fishing like a stream or a river and inline spinners work well because they're in line with your line meaning that as you are dragging it in it is consistent with your amount of pressure right and so if it's if it's off of your line it can get a little wobbly things like that whereas you have a lot more control over this spinner it's going to go directly in which in the area in which you are casting and retrieving it's not going to veer off so inline spinners are great because that flashes in the front of the lure and then the back of the lure maybe has a little bit of a bite indicator meaning with the feather lures there's a bit of like marabou on the back of it um, which can trigger a bite or like maybe a little red tube on the treble hook and so trout seem to be attracted to the flash but they typically don't want to bite the flash they want to buy a little incentive at the end of the lure uh, so inline spinners give that separation where a spinner is spinning on the front of it and then they go and they bite on the back of it and that's why people put like a lot of scent on the feather part of their inline spinners or, you know, the rattling at the bottom of a brass rattle spinner will kind of coax a bite. Um, but yeah, it's that separation. And so it, it allows you to present a flashier lure in front of fish to attract them that may not be wanting to bite a large flashy profile lure because the actual spoon is separated from the hook. Uh, and so that's great for trout. Um, and it's also great for panfish too. I catch a bunch of panfish with like a brass rattle spinner. They bite anything, but it, it just allows like a flashier appearance with a smaller um, consumption area for the fish. So that's the one that I'm using for trout, specifically rainbows and brookies. Uh, browns are getting a little bit big there. I mean, any trout will hit an inline spinner and pretty much any aggressive panfish like perch and bluegill and things like that. Um, even smallmouth bass, uh, a lot of these streams and rivers that hold trout hold those species too. Um, they'll all hit inline spinners and they're easy to cast in those um in those streams and rivers and they're easy to present so those you're just casting out and you're retrieving that's it um the faster you retrieve the higher in the water column they'll go the slower you retrieve the lower they'll go um there's kind of two strategies here you can either send them right through the middle of the water column which is just a consistent retrieve and that's what i've noticed works the most i have a lot of friends that like to nick the blades that's what they call it nicking the blades against the bottom so if it's kind of like a gravelly shoal in that stream or river they like to reel it in after they'd let it drop so they let it drop all the way down to the bottom and they gradually reel it in so that the blade of the spinner nicks against the rocks or the pebbles on the bottom i'm not i'm actually not sure why that works but it works for a lot of them maybe it has something to do with the way that the flash works in the shoals of minnows inside of the shoals of the rocks. Isn't that, that's a very confusing thing that I always, always wondering about is that people call big schools of bait fish shoals, but then they also call those rocky, pebbly, shallow areas on creek beds shoals too. So there you go. Some confusion on your no nomenclature out of Ed Hitchcock today. Anyways, these are the lures that I think you should start out with in your arsenal. I think that they cover a big portion of the strategies in fishing for freshwater species. I also believe that this assortment of the lures that I'm talking about cover a bunch of bases in terms of techniques and tactics. And so if you get, you know, some finesse worms, some stick baits, a curl tail grub or two, a pike spoon, a crank bait, and some inline spinners. I think that that'll cover you for an entire season of lure fishing. I think it'll allow you to target walleye, pike, bass, panfish, and trout. And, you know, this is kind of all that I use uh, 
when I'm doing kind of general fishing. This is this is the fun fishing. This is the family on the shore or the pontoon boat. This isn't the competitive world. This is the, hey, we're going to go out and catch some fish with kids. Um, and this should be the base of your fishing arsenal. Now, over time, as you try to get into specific species, you're trying to target a trophy, you're trying to do more complicated things, your arsenal is going to get a lot bigger. But I've, I catch, you know, 60 70% of my fish on this selection and the ways in which I'm telling you to present them. So, if you are in the market for these, uh, all of the ones that I make are in our freshwater fishing kit. Um, everything that I've talked about in this episode is in our freshwater fishing kit. We make a bunch of more specific styles and sizes and colors and stuff within our species kits, uh, like our trout and our bass and our walleye. But if you just want to get a good base going, like the one that I'm talking about today, you should check out our freshwater fishing kit. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so much for listening. This was an advanced episode. I think my next one is going to be an expert. So stay tuned.